Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks go out to the people who organized this talk tonight, the Toronto Objectivist Committee, yes. and the Freedom Party of Ontario. The organizers for the Toronto Objectivist Committee are Stephanie Bond, Conrad Nagowski, Mark Wickens, and myself. And thank you again for the Freedom of Party's professional help. Um, the leader, Paul McKeever, Robert Metz, Robert Vaughn, who's on technical tonight, and Mary Lou Ambrosio, who did a great hand in helping with the media. Dr. Yaron Brook received his MBA and PhD in finance at the University of Texas. He is the executive, executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute, a columnist at Forbes.com, and his articles have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Investors Business Daily, and many other publications, including the Sun Media Today, and a few others. He is a frequent guest on national radio and television programs and is a contributing editor, author of books and op-ed articles. Dr. Brooke is co-author with ARI fellow Don Watkins, Watkins of the national bestseller, Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. A former finance professor, he speaks internationally on such topics as the causes of the financial crisis, the morality of capitalism, ending the growth of the state and U.S. foreign policy. Let's welcome Dr. Yaron Brook. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you all appreciate uh, the weather I brought with me from California. <laughs> In spite of our tax rates, we get 300 days a year like this. So that's, that's why we're willing to be uh, whipped on a daily basis. So we're here to talk about capitalism. And you know, one of the great, one of the great mysteries uh, that all of us, I think, who, who fight for free markets and who, uh, you know, energized by this idea that of, of capitalism and freedom and everything that that means, one of the great mysteries, I think, to all of us um, is the question of, uh, of why we're losing. Because we are losing. The world is rejecting our ideas, it's moving in the opposite direction. Statism is on the rise, primarily in the West. You know, Asia still hasn't figured this out yet, but they will learn soon enough. Um, and we are rejecting the, the, the tradition, the history, the ideas of capitalism, of freedom, of liberty. And you can see this, you can see this in politics. You can see it in, in Obama administration in the US, government is on a growth spurt. I mean, it's, it's growing left and right. And yeah, people are challenging it, but even the people challenging it, they're challenging it on the little margins, on, on the little bit. I, I like to tell my Republican friends that, you know, a long time ago, uh, after the Great Depression, they said, oh, when we get into power, we're gonna repeal everything FDR did. And then they gave up on that. But then after the Johnson administration, right, the Great Society and Johnson brought the United States welfare and Medicare and Medicaid and all that stuff, the Republicans said, oh, when we get into power, we're going to repeal the Great Society. And of course, most Republicans, when they get into power, they add on to the Great Society. They make it bigger, not any smaller, right? So they're tinkering with the ledgers. They're still on the same path. If you look at American history, it doesn't matter who's president, it doesn't matter who's in the House or the Senate, government grows. Government programs grows, redistribution of wealth grows, regulations grow. You know, don't let anybody tell you that the financial crisis happened because of deregulation under Bush. Because there was no deregulation under Bush. I want to name one deregulation under Bush. I do these debates on the financial crisis and I always ask, what deregulation? And they go, uh, there is none. But it doesn't matter, you know, it grows. It, Europe was seeing seeing what's happening in Europe. You know, they're, they're facing a, a, a dramatic crisis. They're going bankrupt, and they're holding on to those state benefits. They are holding on to the regulatory infrastructure for dear life. They are not giving up on that stuff. 
you know, Greece and Spain, because they're forced to, are making small changes at the small margins. And at the same time, increasing taxes to screw the people who actually make the stuff, who actually build the stuff, right? Because that's how they're going to get the economies out of, out of, uh, out of trouble. Okay. We are losing. Capitalism is in decline in the Western world. And we have to ask ourselves why. And we have to really do soul searching around this because it shouldn't be losing. <laughs> we should be winning. This is the greatest social, political, economic system in human history. Right? People forget 250 years ago, everybody was poor. Everybody. Except like 1%, the aristocrats, you know, who robbed us blind and were, were rich. Right? Everybody was poor. And there were a lot fewer of us. Under that regime, most of us in this room are dead. Never born. It's kind of dead, right? This is a system that allows 6 billion people to live on this planet at the standard of living that we live. It allows for, for a life expectancy of 80 in the West, over 80 in some parts of the West, right? That's more than double what it was 150 years ago. It allows for the technology, for the facilities, for all the innovation, for everything, our standard of living. And there's no question, if you look at reality, if you study the actual facts of history, that this is the case, that it's capitalism, it is the Industrial Revolution, the extent to which countries have allowed for economic freedom, we get these benefits. Right? If you go back and you look at history, why did things change so quickly between 1800, everybody's poor, to 1900, where in relative terms, people are doing pretty well? Why did that happen? Right? How did America, the United States of America, be, go from being a third-rate colony? Americans love this when I tell them they were a third-rate colony. The only reason they won the War of Independence was because the British didn't think they were important enough. But it's true. They were too busy fighting the Spanish and the French and other stuff, right? They went from a third-rate colony to being the mightiest economic military country in human history within 130, 40 years. And is it an accident that that is the period of greatest freedom, economic freedom in human history? And absorb millions and millions and millions of immigrants. More immigrants per capita than any society in human history. And did those immigrants, when they came, destroy jobs? So it worked. They tried this for 140 years. We tried this and it worked. Right? In a sense, you could look at the last 250 years as a giant experiment in which political social systems work and which don't. Right? So we tried capitalism in the United States, or approaching capitalism. It's, it wasn't an ideal system, and there were horrible things about what they did in the 19th century, slavery being the obvious one. But generally, there was more economic freedom in America during the 19th century than in any other country during any other century ever. And the success is astounding. So we tried that. And we tried communism, right? We tried the other side. We tried statism to its fullest, fascism and communism. And I put those together on purpose. Right? And what was the result? Poverty, destruction, and death. And let nobody tell you anything different. Poverty, destruction, and death. That's the consequence of, of socialism. And we tried the mixtures, right? We mixed them. Well, some socialism and some elements of capitalism, and we kind of mixed them up. And we tried all kinds of variations of mixture. And even when you mix them, you can see a correlation between the more freedom you give a country from an economic perspective, the more wealth is created, the better the people are. I mean, there's the economic freedom index. And you can plot how free a country is versus GDP per capita, or whatever measure you want, and you can see a relationship. This is not hard stuff. This is right there in front of our eyes. One of my favorite examples is Hong Kong. You know, here's a little fishing village 70 years ago with nothing, no natural resources, a rock in the middle of nowhere. Today it's seven and a half million people. How many people have ever been to Hong Kong? Yeah, you gotta go once in your life. It is astounding. It's an astounding place. Seven and a half million people live in this place. Skyscrapers that make Toronto and New York look like child's play. It's an exciting, vibrant, dynamic place. And all they do is protect property rights. Uh, it's not perfect capitalism again. But it's as close as we can come today 
And how did people get to Hong Kong? How did it go to seven and a half million? People moved there and they risked their lives to get there. Why? Because it was free. Because there was economic freedom there. Okay? So we've got all these examples. So I don't buy, I don't buy that there's anybody in the world out there who is intelligent and educated, who doesn't know deep down somewhere that capitalism works, that capitalism produces the goods, that it creates a higher standard of living, that it allows for innovation and technology and all these good things. That in terms of standard of living, in terms of wealth creation, it is the best system. Krugman lies when he tells you otherwise. Paul Krugman, the US economist, won a Nobel Prize. There's no way you can't know this because it's right there in front of your face. It's in the history book, but it's in the reality of history. Maybe they don't explain it, but it's in the reality of poverty to wealth. And that has to be explained somehow. And only understanding that capitalism works explain it. And we have a deep understanding of capitalism. It's not just that we have these empirical facts out there and, and that's all. We've got great economists. There's no shortage of great economists who've explained the price system and how these economies work and why competition and innovation thrives on economic freedom and the role of private property. We've got great economists. They've even won some Nobel Prizes. You know, whether it's Friedman or Mises or Hayek, you know, They've explained pieces of this puzzle, and there are lots of others, lots of others. They exist even today. Good, free market economists will get how an economy works. So this is the puzzle, right? This is the mystery. We're losing. That's, a, that's the reality. We have reality on our side. We have history on our side. We have fact on our side. And they're obvious. And we have theory on our side. The economic theory is there. It's solid. Right? And we're still losing. <laughs> What's going on here? So this is what I want, this is what I want us to talk about. I'm going to take this off because it's California weather. It's kind of hot. <laughs> so why are we losing? Why is it that every time there's a problem, every time there's a crisis, every time there's some economic negative event, we blame capitalism. Instinctually, it's almost, before the facts are even known, before we know what happened, oh, it must be the bankers. It's like, and you saw this in the financial crisis. Within days, the headlines were capitalism is dead, Wall Street, it's all Wall Street's fault, the bankers did it. Nobody even looked at the facts, nobody even had time to even evaluate. But it's obvious the bankers. And this is not new, right? The Great Depression was caused by well, Wall Street, we know that. Right? Over-speculation, too much freedom, too much uh, unregulation, lack of regulation. Now, no serious economist today believes that. Because looking back at the evidence, you can evaluate and you can see that it was primarily Federal Reserve policy and government policy that created the Great Depression. But that's not what we teach. And it's not what we hold. And it's not what people at the time thought. They immediately respond, oh, it's capitalism, it's free markets, they caused the Great Depression. And this goes back, you can, you can plot this pattern back 2,000 years. It's always bankers. In those days it was Jewish bankers. Now it's not politically correct to say that. So we just call them bankers. Right? But that's, it's almost like, that's the emotion. That's what comes out. And it's not just bankers, it's capitalism generally. It's freedom. It's economics. It's all of these transactions. And you have to ask yourself, why? What is it about capitalism? What is it about free markets that causes this kind of response? And when I, I should have said this earlier, but when I mean capitalism, I mean capitalism. I mean freedom. Freedom from what? We say freedom, but freedom for what? What are we free of? Coercion. coercion, right? We're free of coercion. That's what freedom means. It means freedom from coercion. It means freedom from people forcing you to do things you don't want to do. Freedom from in the context of capitalism, in the context of free markets, free from whose coercion primarily? Government. government. Government is the most coercive element within our society. Government is the one that regulates, controls, and tells us what we can and cannot do. Our neighbor can try to do that, but we don't have to pay attention to them. And if they pull out a gun, then hopefully the policeman takes them to jail. 
if government's doing their job right. I was just a, no, just as an aside, I was in Brazil this, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, a month ago. I was, uh, I was at a big conference with about 4,000 people there, and I was on a panel with a Brazilian politician, right? And uh, he, was, he was out there saying, oh, they, he's going to make government efficient, and he's going to do this, and he's going to do that. And I got up and I said, you know, government has discovered efficiency for the first time after 200 years. That's a good deal. But I made the case, this is Brazil, right? I made the case that here's Brazil, right? Where well, the one thing the government's supposed to do is protect us physically from harm. Protect our individual rights, but of all those rights, our life is the most precious, right? And, and it, I don't know if you know about crime in Brazil, right? <laughs> but government does a million different things, but the one thing it's supposed to do, it cannot do. Because crime in Brazil is off the charts. I mean, it's a, it's a disaster. Um, so the, you, you typically don't criticize politicians in Brazil, so the audience was quite entertained for this foreigner who uh, dared to say stuff like that about politicians. What I mean by capitalism is, is governments out of our lives in terms of economics, that it has no involvement in our economic life, that it doesn't coerce us to do or not do. I mean free markets, I mean free. Free of coercion, free of government coercion. Okay. So what is it about capitalism? What is it about these free markets that is so, you know, just gets us at the gut and causes us immediately to tell oh, there's something wrong with that? And you can see it if you go out into this university, go out over there and ask people about capitalism, and it's an emotional response. They don't even have time to really think it through. It's a, it's a negative, right? right? It's very, very emotional, very guttural. What is it about capitalism? What is capitalism about? What are markets? Any market. What is a market about? What do people do in a marketplace? They exchange, but they exchange for what purpose? Why are they exchanging? Self-interest, Yeah, so, so why, why does somebody make one of these? Right? Why does Steve Jobs make an iPhone? To sell it. Sell it for what? Because he loves people? Does he care about me? When he, when he builds one of these, is he thinking, oh, you're on... I really like Iran, I want to make him an iPhone. <laughs> I mean, if he did, then why charge me 60% profit margin? What's he trying to do? Make money. Make money. See, you're even a little uncomfortable with that. <laughs> it is, you are. I know. Because nobody wants to admit, right? And it's not just about money. Steve Jobs is more than just money. What else does he want to do? He wants to make something beautiful. He wants to make something useful. He wants his vision. Steve Jobs' vision, to be out there in reality. He loves this stuff, but he loves it. Steve Jobs is being selfish. selfish. He's being self-interested. This is about Steve Jobs. And when I, you know, I tell the story that I went to buy my first iPhone in 2008, when it first came out, and the economy was spiraling out of control. So I went to the mall, bought my iPhone, because I wanted to stimulate the US economy. <laughs> Because, you know, I care about my fellow man, and I didn't want anybody to lose their job and stuff, so I went and buy an iPhone. And I know that's why you guys go to the mall, because you want to make sure there's full employment in those retail stores. <laughs> right? Why do you go to the mall? Why did I buy the iPhone? Because I thought it would make my life better. Because I want to buy nice clothes. Because I want to buy things that will make me more productive. Because I want to do stuff for you. me. You know, and the people I love and the family that I care about. But that's it. I don't really care about the cloak in the store. I mean, I don't. How many of you do? Very few, I'm sure. Right. I care about me. And I exchange with Apple, and I buy the iPhone. When we do that exchange, who loses? Nobody. Nobody. Why does nobody lose? That's weird, right? It's win-win. It's win-win, because I paid 300 bucks for this iPhone. How much is it worth to me? More than 300, otherwise who'd bother, right? I wouldn't bother you to get the money out of the back pocket. It's worth more than 300 to me. And how much is it worth to Apple? A lot less than 300, because they made a nice 60% profit margin on it. Win-win, <laughs> we both won. I don't know about Androids, I'm just talking about iPhones, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. But all exchanges like that, we all go into it with expectation of making who better off? <coughs> Ourselves, but both parties do that. So exchange, voluntary exchange, is win-win. At least we go into the transaction. You make mistakes, you can buy a lemon, things happen, and it turns out not to be in your best interest. But that's not why you do it. You do it to make yourself better off. 
Exchange is win-win. But everybody in capitalism in the marketplace is out for their self-interest. That's why we exchange. That's why we're in the marketplace. Capitalism is the system of the pursuit of self-interest. That's what it is. But what do we know about self-interest? It's evil. It's evil. It's bad. I mean, I was taught when this big, right? What's, what's morality about? What's ethics? What's goodness? What's virtue? Nobility? What are they about? Self-interest? No, they're about sacrifice. About being selfless. About serving others. About doing what's good for the community or your neighbor or your brother or whoever. It's not about you. Right? My mother taught me, always think of other people first. Think of yourself last. Now, again, she didn't really mean that. Most mothers don't. But that's the morality. That's what we're taught. That's what people believe deep down. That's what every preacher for the last 200 years has told us. What every philosopher for the last 200 years has told us. The purpose of your life is to serve. Be selfless. Who are moral? Moral heroes. Our moral heroes are people who give everything up and go and serve the cause. Some cause bigger than themselves, right? That's John McCain's language from the... Right? Don't serve your own interests. Serve something bigger than you. The state, your religion, your neighbors, something. Don't be small-minded and just about you. But that's what capitalism is. It's small-minded. It's all about me. We're about you know, selflessness. Morality says that selflessness is good. And by definition, by necessity, what does that mean selfish is, or self-interest is? Self-interest is what? Is bad. And they, and they tell you, they define for you what self-interest means. Right? They don't leave it alone. Because they want to they really hammer this home. They want to they make sure that you, know, you get this. Self-interest is what? Taking care of self? What are, what, are, what are we taught that self-interest is like? When you point to the kid in the, in the back of the playground and you say, oh, that kid's selfish. You mean he's rationally considering what's good for himself and he's going to work hard to make his life the best that it can be? <laughs> no, what do you mean? He's going he's to lie, steal, cheat, stab people in the back to do anything that gets his way. So now you've got a choice in life. Morality teaches you. You've got a choice in life. You can be self-interested, which means bad, which means lying, stealing, cheating, by every definition, bad. Or you can be selfless and good. Those are the two options. And guess what, what political economic system being selfless is consistent with? Yeah, is it, is it consistent with everybody pursuing their own self-interest? Is it consistent with win-win transactions of trade? No, because all these people are self-interested. And what do we know self-interest is? Lying, cheating, stealing. So it can't be win-win. Somebody's deceiving us. Apple really tricked me into buying it for $300. I didn't really want to. It's all those sub subliminal messages in their advertising that got me to do it. And, and we believe that. I mean, people really believe this stuff. Again, just go out onto the campus and ask. Because that's what they've been trained. Businessmen are crooks. Why are they crooks? Because they're self-interested. Everybody's self-interest is crook. We know that. That's definitional, almost. The good guys, the guys who think about society, think about what's good for other people. Right? Mother Teresa, that's goodness. Bureaucrats, they're good because they're public servants. They don't think about themselves. <laughs> right? I mean, that's funny in many, ways, many reasons for why that's funny. But it's true. Look, look at the Fed. Why do we have a Federal Reserve in the United States? Now, you can come up with lots of economic theories why we have a Federal Reserve. But I have a very simple story on why we have a Federal Reserve in the United States. We had a very powerful banker in the United States in the early part of the 20th century called J.P. Morgan. And he ran his bank with an iron fist. And he was incredible. Most of the industries in the U.S. in the early part of the 20th century, late part of the 19th, were funded by J.P. Morgan. He was a brilliant, brilliant financier. And in 1907, there was a financial crisis for a variety of reasons, primarily related to government policies, but a financial crisis, and J.P. Morgan single-handedly saved the whole system. He got all the bankers in a room and locked the door and said, we're going to sit here until we solve this problem, and they did. Why did he do it? Because it was good for J.P. Morgan. And everybody looked at that. In the beginning, he was a hero. 
wow, J.P. Morgan saved the world. And then they started to think, but wait a minute, he's, he's this private guy and he's doing it for his own interest. That can't be right. How can we trust this guy? He's selfish. He's in it for his own interests. That's wrong. Banking system, that's a big thing. We need, we need to give it to somebody responsible. So let's get rid of private banks and let's start a public bank. Public, owned by the government, right? Let's call it the Federal Reserve and put Alan Greenspan in charge. And we trust Alan Greenspan, why? Because he's doing it for the public interest. He doesn't get bonuses. He doesn't get options. He has no selfish motivation to run the bank. And him we trust. I don't know if you remember the days where we trusted Alan Greenspan. <laughs> Some of you might. But in those days he was God, right? He could not do wrong. Why? He was a smart central planner who could do no wrong and doing it for the good of humanity, not for his own good. So we get rid of J.P. Morgan and we get us Ben Bernanke instead. And why do we trust Ben Bernanke and not J.P. Morgan? Because the one is selfish and the one, other one is selfless. selfless. And you could track industry by industry, regulation by regulation. You know, uh, I like to use elevators as an example. You know, you go, I don't know here in Canada if you have this, but in America you go into an elevator and on the wall there's this little diploma that says that a government bureaucrat has inspected the elevator and it won't fall. Right? Everywhere. Because we know, we know that if we leave it to the marketplace, all the elevators will fall. <laughs> and we need a public servant, somebody who cares about humanity, to inspect the elevators to make sure they don't fall because we know that left alone businessmen will kill their customers because that's how you make money. <laughs> right? McDonald's would poison us. Right? Airplanes would be dropping out of the sky if not for the FAA. We, we know. I mean, we laugh because to some extent this is what the culture believes. This is what we think. Why? Why do we think that? Because they're greedy, because they're selfish, because they're self-interested and therefore they'll cut corners, they'll stab people in the back, they'll do whatever it takes to make a buck. And therefore we need those selfless, responsible, socially conscious bureaucrats to make sure the elevators don't start falling. And that's how you get regulation. Every regulation in the books is this dichotomy. You know, why do we have, you know, I, I only know American regulations, I don't know Canadian, so it's, it's a little harder, but it, one of my favorite examples of American regulation was in, a t in 2000, you remember uh, Enron, remember Enron and WorldCom, and there, were, there was a few cases of fraud, right, these CEOs committed fraud, and they were caught and ultimately went to jail. Um, but the f mood in America then was, they were all crooks, every single one of them was crooks, and I know this because, uh, you know Bill O'Reilly, right, on Fox? Right? I mean, if you want to know the mood of America, just watch Will O'Reilly, because he's a populist. He puts his finger out into the wind and says what he thinks everybody wants him to say. So in 2002, I was on Bill O'Reilly's show, and he wanted to fire every CEO in America because they were all crooks. And how did he know? Look at Enron, WorldCom, and so on. He caught four, therefore they were all crooks. And why were they all crooks? Because they were all self-interested, and all they care about is profit. And profit equals lying, stealing, cheating. That's what it equals. And I had to defend businessmen. I said, first of all, they're innocent until proven guilty, but you know, most of them, by the way, Bill, you work for a corporation that has a CEO. Is he a crook too? Um, he got really angry with me. Um, he, didn't like, he didn't like me. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was the mood in the country. And what did they do? They passed a bill called Sarbanes-Oxley. This is a massive piece of regulation in the United States, the biggest in probably 50 years, that put in accounting controls in American businesses that basically put a bureaucrat on the shoulder of every CFO and CEO in America monitoring everything that they did. Because you can't trust them. They're all crooks. But that comes from the selfishness. This comes from this idea of self-interest. That's the regulatory state. The regulatory state is a product of this dichotomy in morality, in ethics. That's a weird thing, right? Regulations are a consequence of this view of morality, of ethics. And the entitlement state is easier to show, right? Why do we have entitlements? Because your moral responsibility is to care, take care of other people. It's your moral obligation. And you know what? If I leave you free, if I leave you alone, you won't do it. I can guarantee you won't do it. Because there's always somebody in need. And somebody's need, it, 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 the fact that they have a need means you're not fulfilling it. So I'm just benevolent government 
helping you become a better person. I'm asking you, I want to raise your taxes so that you can help that person over there who needs your help. They don't have enough health care. Or they don't have a good enough house. Or they don't eat good enough food. So I'm going to take a little bit of your money and give it to them. And we all say, okay. Because we all vote for these taxes. Right? We don't, they're not imposed on us. Some of us. <laughs> but most of us vote for them. In, in, in the United States. You know, people think, uh, you remember Romney's 47% comment? 47% get money from the government so they all vote Obama. Nonsense. How many rich people voted for Obama? Well, of the 10 richest counties in the United States, how many do you think voted for Obama? Eight. So you guys are even worse than I am. Right? Eight. And why did they vote? Because Obama lets them relieve some guilt. In California, we know this well because we just raised our own taxes. We had a referendum to raise the taxes on, on the wealthiest Californians from 10%, this is state taxes, on top of federal taxes, from 10% to 13.3%. That's over a 30% increase. What do you think the rich in California did? They voted for it. Because it's their all obligation to do it. How could they not? They would be selfish if they didn't vote for it. People do not vote their pocketbook. People don't vote economic interests. People don't vote what's good for them. People vote what they think is right, what they think is just, what they think is good. And this is why Obama wins. Obama wins because he talks the language of morality. He talks the, the language of ethics. He talks justice and fairness and what's right and what's wrong. And the Republicans won't touch that because they agree with him. They just disagree about the means, but they agree on the end. They agree about the morality. The left has a moral high ground. In Canada, in, in Europe, in the US, the moral high ground is dominated by the left. The right won't touch it. They won't touch talking about morality. And if they do, it's all in religious terms. And if they do, they've accepted the same morality as the left, because the religious morality, to a large extent, is the same as the left morality. And you've lost the game. There's always somebody in need. There's always somebody I can go to and ask them to increase their taxes, and we're always, almost always going to vote for it. Particularly if I can show the need. And we're going to feel guilty. And the more need there is, the more we give people stuff, guess what happens? The more they need. The more they need. When do they stop needing? When everybody's equal. That's what they mean by fairness and justice. They mean equality. But that ain't happening. So there's always going to be more need. There's always going to be more taxes. And unless you challenge the fundamental belief that you morally owe that person something, you lose. You have to lose. You'll always lose. So this is the real challenge we have. It's not about economics. It's not about politics. It's about ethics. As long as we accept this duality of selfless morality being good, self-interested morality being bad, being evil, being lying, stealing, cheating, we lose. We've given them all high ground, they will always win. What Ayn Rand does, what Ayn Rand does is challenge that whole conception of morality. She says, why is it my moral obligation to help other people? Why do I owe somebody who needs stuff? Why do I owe him anything? Why is my life, why is my life given to somebody else? Why is it less important than somebody else's life? Why is my moral obligation to serve? And she rejects that whole notion. But she also rejects the idea that serving one's own life is about lying, stealing, cheating, or exploiting, or taking stuff from others. She says that's a false dichotomy. Those two things are not right. Morality is not about exploitation. Morality is about being truly self-interested. Which means rationally self-interested. Long-term self-interested. Pursuing your values, making the best of your life. Now why rational? Why do we say rational self-interest? Because if you think about human values, where do they come from? Everything in this room. I mean, you can't point to anything in this room. Where, does, where, do, where do values come from? Where do everything that human beings create come from? Clothes we wear. The, the clothes from where? The mind. The mind, right? How many of you have the gene to, to produce clothes? <laughs> right? I put you in the middle of the Amazon, you know how to skin the thing and take the clothes and do whatever you do with them to take the fur and turn it into... I mean, nobody knows how to do that, right? 
We don't have that gene. Somebody had to figure it out. Anybody have the gene for agriculture? Any farmers here? <laughs> no gene, though. You have to learn it. I mean, the guy who saw the seed drop down and water sprinkle over it and something grew up and, and made the integration that those are related and there's a causal factor was the Einstein of his day. And the guy who took that knowledge and turned it into agriculture was the Steve Jobs of his day, the entrepreneur of his day, the Bill Gates. Right? That takes reason. It takes thinking. It takes observation and integration and using your mind, using logic to figure it out. Right? All human values at the end of the day come from our ability to reason. That is the way in which we survive and it's the way in which we thrive. So if you really care about yourself, which is what being self-interested means, it means taking care of self, making your own life your highest priority, then the first thing you need to do is cultivate your mind, is cultivate your reason, cultivate your rational ability and pursue rational values in order to make your life the best life that it can be. So what Rand is saying is, no, morality is about how to pursue your own self-interest. What are the virtues that you should try to gain, that you should try to live up to in order to achieve your self-interest? That's what the study, the science of morality should be about. Not about how to sacrifice, not about how to defeat yourself, not about how to live for other people. Why? My life's mine. It's about how to make my life the best life that it can be. And if you want to live the best life that it can be, that you can have, do you want government sitting on your shoulder telling you what you can and cannot do? How to run your life, how to run your business, what to do, what not to do? No, you want to go out there and explore. You want to go out there and live. You want to go out there and pursue values. And you might fail. But if you're rational, what happens when you fail? You learn from it and you rise up. If you're poor and you believe in the value of your own life, do you want a check from somebody else every month? Do you want to live off of somebody else's production? No. You don't want that. You want to know that you are capable of producing enough to take care of yourself. That's how we get self-esteem. How does self-esteem, how do we get self-esteem in life? Earning. From achieving stuff. From overcoming challenges, from setting goals and achieving them. If you don't set goals, you don't get self-esteem. And without self-esteem, you can never, ever be happy. And isn't it all at the end about happiness? That's at least what Ayn Rand tells us. Morality's goal, the goal of life, is ultimately to live a flourishing, complete, whole, happy, happy life. Happiness is the goal. We can't get there without self-esteem. And you can't get self-esteem without working on it, without being challenged, without taking care of yourself, without building something, without creating stuff. We actually destroy the poor when we give them welfare. We destroy their capacity for self-esteem, and therefore we destroy their capacity ever to be happy. They are the victims, at least the ones who would want to work, the ones who would want to achieve. So morality tells us, no, your life is not owned by somebody else. You do not owe them. Their need is not a claim against you. Your life is yours to live as you see fit in pursuit of the values you think will lead to your own happiness. In pursuit of the things that you believe are going to make you a successful person, a flourishing person. And it's that morality that we, if we believe in capitalism, if we want the goodies that capitalism provides, that is the morality we need to fight for. And if we don't, we don't get capitalism. If we stick to the old moral code, we will get the old political system. We will get the same statism. You will not get capitalism under a regime, under a moral regime that believes that your life is not yours to live. That your life you owe it to others. So the revolution, you know, uh, my book's called Free Market Revolution. The revolution is not an economic revolution. It's not a political revolution. This is an ethical revolution. This is a moral revolution that we're asking people to consider. This is about what is the good? What is virtue? What value should people pursue? And we reject Again, 2,000 years of philosophy, 
2,000 years of religion, we reject the notion that morality is about being selfless and about sacrifice and about serving others. And what we are asking people is to consider, to consider the revolutionary morality that Ayn Rand presents, a morality based on your own self-interest, your rational pursuit of your own self-interest over a long term. And you know, what we need is to, is, to, is to discover that morality and through it resurrect a political system that respects the rights of individuals. Because what does the right mean? What do individual rights mean? They mean freedom. Freedom to act. Freedom to act in pursuit of what? Happiness. happiness. Life. Your life. Your happiness. So what we really need to resurrect politically is the spirit of the founding of America. The spirit that says that you have an inalienable right. Inalienable means what? Nobody can take it away from you. Nobody. For those who believe in democracy, not even the vote, not even a majority, not even 99.9% .9 of the people. They cannot take it away from you. You have an inalienable right to what? To serve your fellow man? See, your life. You have an inalienable right to your life. Now that's self-interested. Because it's your life, each one of you. You have an inalienable life to liberty, right to liberty. The right to liberty means you have a right to think whatever you want to think, to act based on those thoughts, to execute, to try, to fail, to succeed. And it's yours. The fruits of your success are yours. You don't owe them to anybody else. You're not a servant, you're not a slave to anyone. That's what liberty means. So you have an inalienable right, and in the most self-interested political statement in human history, each one of us has an inalienable right to pursue our own happiness. Now if we can capture that spirit and everything that that statement means, then, and only then, does capitalism win. Thank you all. Questions? No, just questions. Okay, we're opening for a question period. Oh, are we going to use a mic? Okay. Oh, are we going to have people come up to a mic? Yes. Or are we going to just have them yell? <laughs> How do you want to do it? Well, let's start, because otherwise people get restless. Who, who wants to ask a question? Okay, yeah. So, can you elaborate um, about how it's not in our self-interest to exploit others? A lot of times people, you know, when I hear people criticize Ayn Rand, they'll say things like, oh yeah, you and your Ayn Rand ideas, try living on an island, try living without other people, and things like that. And obviously they're missing the point. Well, the point is a, a very fundamental point, right? Why would I want to live on a desert island, right? I want other people. Other people are wonderful for a variety of different reasons. You know, anywhere from iPhones, which they produce, I don't, to sex. Other people are good things, right? <laughs> the question is, how do you deal with other people? Do you deal with other people in a sacrificial way where their happiness depends on me? I need to give, I need to... Or, or you traitors. And... What Rand is saying is that trade is the means by which we deal with other people, and we want other people. We are not isolationists as individuals. We are not about going out into the wilderness and living alone. Quite the contrary. I love civilization. Right? But as a trader. Now, you're asking a deep question about why is it not in my self-interest to lie, cheat, and steal? That's another part of your question. So let's take an example. The, ex the typical example of the, of the capitalist is, I like to use Bernie Madoff, because he's such a juicy example, right? Here's a guy who lied, steal, and cheated in order to attain what? Money, right? Money. Was he happy? No. Was he happy? His life was a living hell. Now, you can ask you this, how many people here have lied? Uh, you don't have to be here. Um, lying is one of the dumbest strategies ever. 
It's a dumb strategy because it doesn't get you what you want. Not in the long term. It gets you instant gratification at best. But it doesn't get you what you want. You almost always get caught, which has severe consequences, ask Bruni. But half the time you're just worried about getting caught, which creates anxiety, which is not good for you either. Right? Think about Bernie Madoff. Why was it living hell? Because he was living, he was lying to all his best friends. He was lying to his family. He was lying to his sons. He was lying to his business associates. Everybody he met on a day-to-day -day basis, he was lying to. I, how do you live with that? Right? With, with the knowledge you're going to get caught, you don't know who's going to pull you in, you don't know when it's going to happen, you don't know what you're going to slip out, you, don't know, you can't remember who you lied to and who you didn't lie to. It's just, it's just overwhelming. And he, he lived hell. He said he's happier in jail now than he was before he was caught. Right? And I believe it because I think of the times that maybe I've lied and I know how bad that makes you feel. Not because of this consciousness. Just because practical reality means that it's going to screw me. I'm going to be worse off because of the lie. Right? I mean, lying almost always necessitates more lying. Almost always. And you know, I've reached an age where I can barely remember what happens. Right? Like, ask me what happened last week, and I really have to make an effort to remember it. Now, if I start lying, I have to remember two things. <laughs> actually, it's many more than two things. I have to remember what actually happened, because some people I told what actually happened. Then I have to remember the lie. Then I have to remember who I told the lie to, why I told the lie to them. That's just ridiculous, right? Reality and truth are so much simpler. Fundamentally, reason requires what? To work. Rationality, logic requires what? Facts. Truth. Reality. Lying is what? Untruth. Unfacts. Unreality. We have a term in computer science called garbage in, garbage out. Reason, lying is the same thing. You put garbage in here, you get garbage out the other side. Reason, rationality, your means of survival will not work if you lie, cheat, steal. Think of the self-esteem consequences of stealing. You're so pathetic that you can't take care of yourself that you have to live off of other people by stealing from them. That leads to happiness? No way. Lying, stealing, cheating, uh, all those things are awful strategies for happiness, awful strategies for success. Reality, truth, reason, thinking it through, working hard, achieving stuff, making stuff, that's how you attain happiness. That's how you attain success in life. Okay. So, and Bernie Madoff, again, is a great example because who turned him in? His sons. You think of something more tragic than your sons, and then what happened? What did his son do a year anniversary after he turned him in? His son committed suicide. Right? And none of his family will talk to Bernie. And Bernie's still happier than he was before he was caught. That's how awful lying and stealing and cheating is to your son, to who you are as a human being. So it's not a self interested strategy. Let's get rid of it once and for all. It's not in your self interest to do those things. You got to figure out what is, but that's not. Yeah. You choose. Yeah. Thank you. I have a uh, question uh, regarding your win win situation with Steve Jobs and um, purchasing the iPhone. Now, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here, but uh, now, what would you say to um, you know, all the waste? and the, you know, the 81 gallons of water that was used to create that one phone, which ultimately you know, could potentially harm humanity. Even Steve Jobs himself you know, contracted cancer. Now, w what would you say to that? How does, how does Ayn Rand's uh, principle fit into that equation? So I, just, I guess I don't get it. Uh, you know, the, the notion that cancer didn't exist before technology is bizarre. Cancer's always existed. People who lived long enough to get it always got it. And they died far quicker than they do today. Today, because of that technology, we can keep people alive in spite of having cancer. Um, 
let's just deal with the environmental issue, right? The human, the human environment, which is the only environment I care about, with all due respect to spotted owls and the like, I care about human beings. The human environment has never, ever been better than it is right now. You breathe cleaner air, you drink cleaner water, you have longer life, healthier life. Life is great out there. And we're worried about it. 80 gallons of water? Who cares? I mean, who literally cares? And what, are you worried about future generations? They're going to be so rich, they're going to make you look ridiculous to, for caring about them. Let them solve their problems. But the, the whole idea of future generations is bizarre to me if we believe in progress. Because what we're saying is we're going to cripple our own lives, us poor people, we're, going to, we're very poor compared to them, in order to benefit some rich generation, three generations out. We know what technology they're going to have. Here's the hypothetical, think about this. In, in the middle of the 19th century, they were using coal to do everything, which meant there was soot in the air and it was dirty. And it was really harmful for people. They were breathing this stuff in, it wasn't good for them. Imagine the environmentalist movement then shutting down coal in the name of future generations, us. But that would have shut down the Industrial Revolution. And most of us wouldn't be alive today because they thought about us and they cared about us and they loved us. <laughs> we would be dead. <laughs> With all due respect to future generation, let them worry about it. I don't, half the, half the environment, not half, 99% of the environmentalist scares I don't believe. I mean, just think about it. This is their track record, right? Track record. In 19, uh, what was it, 62 or 63, because it's 100 years, it's, uh, it's uh, 50 years. Uh, in 63, uh, Silent Spring was published, claiming that DDT was killing the environment. Everybody, it was just this awful, horrible substance that was just destructive, and we need to stop it immediately. So they did. It turns out the science was all wrong. And it turns out that because we stopped using DDT, mosquitoes are killing people every year. About a million people die of malaria because we don't use DDT to kill the mosquitoes. And there's no proof, no scientific proof DDT is harmful to anything. Indeed, they're starting to reintroduce DDT now. 50 years later, 50 years later, millions of people have died because of that book. Oh, but in the late 60s, Robert Ehrlich, famous Stanford professor, wrote a book about the population bomb. And he said, Imminently, hundreds of millions of people in the world are going to die of starvation. This was 68 or 69, right? You remember the 70s? You remember the massive starvation all around the world in the 70s? It didn't happen. Okay, but then in the early 70s, they said, oh, but because of human activity, the earth is going to cool and we're going to have an ice age. And we, front page, New York Times, Time Magazine, everywhere. Oh, that didn't happen. Now I'm really trusting. I'm a finance guy. If somebody comes to me and said, I've lost money every single year, but give me this time I'm right. What are you going to do? Give him money? <laughs> well, I am trusting the environmentalists. I don't believe any of their stories because it's not motivated by fact. It's not motivated by tr truth. They are just, you know, Ayn Rand identified them in the late 1960s. She, she wrote an essay called The Anti-Industrial Revolution. And she talked about, in those days, they were called ecologists. They weren't even called environmentalists. And she said, they're not motivated by human environment. They're not motivated by human well-being. They're not motivated by making human life better. They're motivated by destruction. They're motivated by hatred. They're motivated by, they're, they're Luddites, just like Luddites have always been. They're anti-technology, anti-progress, anti-human being. There's no product in human history. And, and if you ever watch Alex Epstein on, on video, you, can, you, know, you get a whole elaboration of this. There's never been a product that has benefited human beings more than oil. There is no product in human history that has done more good for mankind than oil. Look at the number of products just in this room made from oil. All the plastics. Right? All the transportation around us. The electricity, maybe not oil, maybe it's natural gas, but it's a, it's a carbon, carbon fuel, right? And yet, you say that at an American university and they'll stone you to death. They'll boycott you. We, we've got universities now boycotting oil. Again, no product in human history has done more benefit for humankind, has improved the human environment more than oil. I challenge you to find one. 
Maybe. <laughs> right? And this is the attitude. That says to me, they don't really care about human beings. And then when you tell them, oh, global warming, right? They, they talk about climate change. It's not global warming because they, they, they missed on that one too, so it's climate change. That's it. That's the way to do it, right? You hedge yourself. Climate change, if it cools, it was your fault. If it warms, it was your fault. And if it stays the same, it's your fault, right? <laughs> you say, okay, well, let's do nuclear. God forbid you choose nuclear. Nuclear is like clean, there's no carbon, it's wonderful for the environment, right? They won't even do that. And that reveals everything you need to know about them. They're not about solutions. They're not about human life. They're not about human progress. They're about destruction, limited, limiting our possibilities, limiting industry, and destroying. Now, what is a solution to whatever environmental problems really exist? Private property. Yeah. Private property. If you, if you sell the rivers, nobody will pollute the rivers because it will be owned by somebody. You know, you can't drop, your, you can't drop your, bar, your garbage in my backyard, right? We've known that for like a thousand years. S common law has defined property rights as you can't drop your garbage. Well, let's apply that to the, to, the, to the lakes, to the rivers, to the oceans, to whatever we need to, to the air. It's just a matter of being innovative enough in terms of legal theory to, to, to find ways to attribute property rights to those characteristics or to defend property rights with regard to those characteristics. Not hard. It's doable. That's the solution to pollution, to real pollution, versus the mythology of pollution. Yes, um, knowing that you're a, uh, an academic and uh, interested in not putting forward anything that would be construed to be lies and not, uh, uh, you know, exaggerating anything, um, well, let me first of all say, number one, I'm a businessman. I own my own company. I have since 1981. Um, I see a lot of young people in the room here. When I was young, Ayn Rand was all the rage in, in the schools. And in fact, in fact, I read all of them, uh, including ones that are less popular and weren't made into movies. But here's a question for you. Um, I, a, a couple of things, because number one, you said, what regulations were rolled back that could have caused the financial problems? Now, I know you're aware of one of these because you wrote a dissenting article in Forbes.com concerning Glass-Steagall. So you know that Glass-Steagall was rolled back by the Graham leach bliley Act. Uh, you didn't happen to mention that uh, Senator Graham uh, also had a wife who was... I have a question. My question is, how do you reconcile this, how do you manage to not know about the Commodity Futures Modernization Act that directly led to Enron? How do you not know that that senator's wife was a director of Enron? How do you not know those things? Uh, it, it seems very strange to me that that, that would, and, and also how, how is it that when you put forward that article on the, uh, the Glass-Steagall Act that you sort of halo branded it with Joseph Stiglitz's image, who was an a, uh, extremely well-known and award-winning economist, when you know that he doesn't agree with you. So let me, let me deal with that one, because that's the easiest one. I didn't choose the photos, that's Forbes. So if you have a complaint about Stiglitz, I think he was put there as the counter to our argument. But that's Forbes magazine, that's not me. I, I don't choose the images, or the title, by the way. The titles of all the Forbes pieces are chosen by Forbes. Uh, oh, sure I know about Glass-Steagall, right? And I've written an article about it to show, and the article starts proving that it had nothing to do with this financial crisis. And if you want to ask me a particular question about particularly why Glass-Steagall didn't cause the financial crisis, I'd be happy to tell you why it didn't, but it didn't. There's no proof, there's no evidence. I've asked people, I've read Krugman, I've read Stiglitz, and they have zero, zero evidence to suggest that Glass-Steagall had anything, the repeal of a portion of Glass-Steagall anything to do with the financial crisis. Um, all the banks that went bust were either pure commercial banks, regular banks, not Glass-Steagall banks, or pure investment banks. Lehman Brothers did not have deposits. Bear Stearns had no deposits. Merrill Lynch had no deposits. The one Glass-Steagall bank I can think of that got into trouble, real trouble, and that's Citibank. But Citibank always gets into trouble. <laughs> I mean, literally, Citibank has been gone bankrupt four times in four decades. 
It went bankrupt because of uh, South American debt in the 1980s. You, you remember US bailed out Mexico in 84, 86? I can't remember which date. You know why they bailed out Mexico? Because Citibank owned all the bonds, and you bail out Mexico in order to bail out Citibank. In 1991, December of 1991, Citibank was bankrupt because of commercial real estate loans, and the Federal Reserve engineered a massive decline in interest rates in order to bail out Citibank. I know the history of these things. It has nothing to do with Glass-Steagall. That's before Glass-Steagall, and they still got bankrupt. So there's no evidence. Washington Mutual was not a Glass-Steagall bank. It was a pure SNL. It was a saving on loans. It did mortgages. So was Countrywide. So was every one of those banks. I, so it has nothing to do. Now, don't I know about Graham's wife? Sure. You want me to list all the cronyism that exists in America? Every single legislation has somebody involved in something that's benefiting somehow from it. Yes, America's a crony country. That's not capitalism. I'm arguing for capitalism. There's no cronyism in capitalism. There's cronyism in statism. That's why I hate the term crony capitalism, because they're not various forms of capitalism. There's only capitalism. And then there's cronyism, and then there's socialism, and there's statism. See, yes, America's a completely screwed up place where people are benefiting from government in a way that's inappropriate. I'm not defending Graham's wife. Now, did the, did the regulation that you mentioned on commodities cause the financial crisis? No. Did it cause Enron? No. It didn't cause Enron. Did accounting rules that are bizarre and weird passed by government help Enron get away with what it did? Absolutely. Why do we have accounting rules? Why is the government involved in accounting? Whose business is? Why is the business of government how we do accounting? Why don't exchanges do that? Why don't accounting firms do that? Why doesn't the marketplace do that? So they can tax it. Well, no, so they can control it. So they can determine what you do and don't do. So, sure, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. But it's not deregulation that caused the crisis. Now, I'm not going to say that certain deregulatory bills didn't create incentives that were bad. Sure they did. But so did regulatory bills. So does everything the government does. What I'm saying is in a free market, truly free market, the financial crisis cannot happen. This financial crisis cannot happen. And indeed, financial crises, when you go back in history, are all caused by government manipulation of typically the currency, but of, of business. True free markets don't have systemic risk. You know who has systemic risk? People talk about systemic risk. The Federal Reserve creates systemic risk. The SEC creates systemic risk. The FDIC creates systemic risk. Entities regulate every bank, they control every institution. They create risk across the entire system. Banks, individual banks, don't create systemic risk. Not in a free market. The Fed what? Of course it is. Who appoints the chairman of the Federal Reserve? The President of the United States, and he's approved by Congress, and he reports to Congress. Who approves the, who approves the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve? The government does. The President and Congress do. Um, where do the profits of the Federal Reserve go? Right? If it was a private entity, wouldn't the profit go to the owners? No. It turns out they don't go to the bankers. Where do the profits of the Federal Reserve go? To the Treasury, to the government. The Federal Reserve is a... Absolutely, check it out. The profits of the Federal Reserve all go to the Treasury. There's actually a lot of concern about the fact that when interest rates go up, the Federal Reserve is going to show losses. And there'll be no money going to the Treasury, which will increase the deficit in the United States. Because right now, the Treasury counts the money it gets from the Fed to decrease the deficit. Nice, nice little profit machine that they created. Um, He's got a microphone, so I'm not determining the, the rate here. Yeah. All right, thank you for uh, your talk, Professor Brooke. I just have one question. Sure. Um, do you think in um, a free market there should ever be, um, in any instances, limitations on freedom of expression of artists in particular? Um, and it's an important question to me uh, because it's just been something I've been grappling with for a while. So if you could just say something about that, and especially in a society where you have lots of artists making money off whatever it is they want to say and so forth. So. Well, yeah, I mean, as long as, the, as, long as your expression is, is, you know, is expression, then yeah, you should, freedom of speech is an absolute. It's not a relative thing. Now, as long as you're not violating other people's property rights, as long as you're not violating their intellectual property rights, as long as you're, it's yours, then absolutely, freedom of speech is an essential part of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Indeed, that's what liberty, to a large extent, is about. It's about the freedom to think. That's the primary. 
and then the freedom to express your thoughts in action and in words. And you have every right to do that. Now again, that doesn't mean you have a right to somebody else's radio station or somebody else's TV or somebody else's museum. They get to choose who they get to talk to. But on your property, you can say whatever you want. You can express yourself in any way. <coughs> By the way, whether it's good or bad, I might hate your art. I'm, not personal, right? I might hate the art, but you still have a right to express it. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Brooke, for speaking. Um, I uh, just wanted to say something in relation to the gentleman back there uh, with respect to the free markets. Okay. Okay. Um, I okay. I, I just. I, maybe it's just a comment, but basically, going back to all the crises, financial crises, 1994 in Mexico, 1998 with r the Russian ruble and uh, long-term capital management, uh, you know, the 2008 financial crisis. Every single one of those involved some form of major regulatory arbitrage going on, meaning the companies were working with governments worldwide to basically trade in products that were specifically designed around government regulation. I used to teach finance, I used to teach financial markets and banking, and most of the products that exist out there, the innovations in finance, are designed to get around regulations. So much brain power, so much brain power is devoted to getting around regulations. What a waste! If you got rid of the regulations, it'd actually be doing stuff that's purely aimed at production. Now, getting around regulation, not for, just for the sake of getting around regulation, it's getting around regulation so the banks can do their job, which is to allocate capital. But absolutely, every one of those involve regulatory arbitrage. You see it all the time. It creates false incentives. It creates moral hazard. All of those, by the way, are moral hazard cases. When you bail out Mexico, then everybody thinks you're going to bail out everybody. The IMF's been bailing everybody out left and right. So everybody misbehaves because they know they're going to be bailed out. Um, 98, yeah, 98 was, that was started in, Th in, in Thailand and, and spiraled through the world, but every one of those. All of those are government mistakes reinforced by financial institutions that are acting based on the incentives that governments provide them. I have a, I have a question about the uh, moral transformation, uh, or moral revolution, rather. About, uh, about, about, about the feasibility of it in light of the fact that human beings have always organized themselves into groups, whether it's tribes, whether it's nations, whatever. It seems to be encoded in our DNA, our morality of service to others perhaps even flows from that fact. The fact that we, um, we, we, ha we feel the sense of belongingness uh, with others. It's, a ver it's very emotional. When we see somebody uh, is it, it, a, a member of our group uh, suffering, uh, you know, we, we want, we, there's this desire to help them, right? There's this desire to serve. And, and, so, um, and, and so it seems to me that uh, uh, this, this moral revolution, um, I, I, I just don't see how it's possible in light of, in light of this, this very, very human, we, because and it, it seems to be rooted in, in biology. And that's the first, the first. And the second, the second thing is, the, uh, just one, uh, one last question, where you, um, in the, in the beginning, you kind of made this, you, you, you presented this dichotomy of, 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 of goodness is service to others and selfishness is evil, and, 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 we, and, and, and the revolution would reverse that. But I, I, it seems to me that's kind of a caricature. Why, 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 not, why not combine the best elements of, of both? Um, okay, I get it, I get it. So you, you, want, you, you want both. And you know, that's like, that's like just taking a little bit of poison in my view, but um, combining good food with poisonous food. Look, yeah, we want to be in groups. Groups are incredibly beneficial to us. And I talked about that. I said, we're not isolationists. We don't believe in living in the forest alone. We want to be in a group where there's voluntary exchange, where there are win-win relationships, where the essential characteristic of human relationship is trade. I give you, I give back. And I think that's true in spiritual terms as well as material terms. The fundamental is that exchange, that trade. And yes, we're an animal biologically, that benefits from that enormously. It's, 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 it, trade is an incredible value to us. And societies that trade grow and succeed. Societies that don't, where trade is destroyed, are destroyed. So that, that group, as a voluntary group in which we trade, is a huge value to all of us. And there's nothing I said 
about the morality of self-interest contradicts that. It's in my self-interest to belong to a group in which we voluntarily are exchanging products and exchanging spiritual values, right? The question is, and this is where they, the morality that you call a character, but it's not. This is the way morality is taught. That the morality that says that no, you get moral points only when you sacrifice, when you lose when somebody else has gained. If you gain and everybody else gains with you, that doesn't count. That's a trade. That doesn't count morally. I mean, th here's an example I like to use. Bill Gates, right? Bill Gates builds Microsoft. He makes $100 billion for himself while building Microsoft. He helps every human being on the whole planet. There's not a human being on the planet that is not being touched positively by Microsoft. Lives are better off all over the world because Bill Gates made $100 billion. Because he made $100 billion by trading with billions of people out there and making their lives better off because he traded with them. Does he get one iota of moral credit? Moral, not business. Moral credit for that? No. Not in the culture we live in. When does he get moral credit? When he leaves Microsoft, so he's not being self-interested anymore, and he gives it away. So now he's a good guy, and he gets some moral credit, but not quite all the moral credit, because we're a little suspicious of him. Because I have the sneaky feeling that he's enjoying this. <laughs> so he's only going to get some moral credit, because he might actually be pursuing something he actually values. What would more Bill Gates have to do to get to become a saint, to become a really good guy. He'd have to give it all away, move into a tent, and bleed a little bit. <laughs> now, none of us would want to be Bill Gates at that point, because none of us want to do that kind of sacrifice. But that's what morality demands. That's what the morality of altruism is about. It's not about being benevolent. It's not about being nice to people. It's about serving others. It's about your life being subservient to the life of other people. And it's wrong, it's evil, it's bad. Altruism, there's nothing good about it. I don't want to mix a little bit of altruism with my self-interest. Because you know what? If I'm self-interested, how do you think I treat people? As human beings. They produce. They're good for me. They make my life better. If they're producing an iPhone, I get to trade with them and make my life better. And if somebody's suffering, and I know they're suffering not because of their own... Not for their own fault, because their house burned down or something bad happened to them. I would help them. I'm benevolent. I love human beings. I'm actually, I think more people in the globe is better, right? Six billion right now, let's make it 10. Because with 10 billion, there'll be more people producing more stuff, more people for me to trade with. I'll become, automatically, I become richer. Right? So I love people. But there's not an ounce of sacrifice. There's not an ounce of selflessness in my love of other people. I love other people because it's good for me. I love other people because my life is better off for them. I want more people to be born because I love Beethoven and I love Michelangelo. I, I love artists, right? I love art. You go, you go to my house and it's plastered with paintings all over the world. It's like the old academies. You can't find any space between the paintings or something. I have sculptures everywhere. I love this stuff. And you know what? If there are more people born, there's more probability of a Michelangelo born. I love that. And if somebody's, somebody's suffering, again, for no fault of their own, sure, I'd help them. But you know what? I'm going to help my kids first. Why am I going to help my kids first? Because I love them more. They're more valuable to me. And I'm going to help my neighbor first before I send my money to Africa. Because my neighbor is more likely to impact my life positively than the people in Africa are going to impact my life. So I don't care that much about people in Africa. That's a fact heartless, whatever you want, but I don't. Because their impact on my life is marginal. The impact on my neighbor is great. The standard for my caring for other people is whom? Me. I don't need any altruism for that. And indeed, that creates, in my view, the most benevolent society in history. Think about what happens. If, if you, if, if, in my view, Altruism creates malevolence, it creates hatred, it creates envy, it creates resentment. Because if we all believe that we all owe a moral duty to help others, that's our moral obligation, that's the essence of morality. And I'm poor, nobody's helping me. Those rich guys over there, they're screwing me. Their moral obligation is to help me and they're not living up to it. What does that lead me to do? I hate them, I resent them, because they're not doing what they're supposed to do, which is help me. But if I flip that around and say, no, your moral obligation is to take care of yourself. Their moral obligation is to take care of themselves. And you know what? In a 
free market, when people take care of themselves, everybody's better off. So when I see a rich guy, I go, cool. That means I'm better off because of him. Bill Gates made $500 billion. That is incredible because everybody else is better off. Nah, that's a free market. Put aside the cronyism. In a true free market, right? Bill Gates making billions means I'm better off. That's benevolence. I respect other people. And I know that my life is my responsibility, not theirs. So I don't envy them, I don't resent them, I don't hate them for their success. All I want is for me to be successful, so I work hard to be successful. That's the kind of society I want to live in. Hi, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Yaron Brook. Thanks for your um, presentation. I ran a tutoring business for about uh, six, seven years, and I had 15 clients, and I built it myself, so it was very difficult and challenging. And I don't know if you're aware of the situation in Canada. We've been under socialism for like the last three decades. So we finally have a capitalist government, Mr. Stephen Harper. And sorry, uh, it, I know I'm very unpopular for saying that, but Ontario is the last bastion for liberal stronghold in the country federally. All their problems is, you know, through in the towel because we've tried Pierre Trudeau socialism. And so what I want to what I want to know is when you say that all business people are crooks, how can I be a crook when I built my business legitimately, sincerely, and honestly, and based on my own self-interests? And what you're, you seem to be advocating is socialism. If you look across the pond at Europe, Portugal, Spain, Cyprus... But I never said that. They're going bankrupt. Socialism is bankrupt in Europe. So what, what, you know, what, what alternative vision do you have for Canada that wouldn't, that wouldn't make Canada end up like the European Union? I'm not, I'm not sure what lecture you listen to. Um, <laughs> But I never called businessmen crooks. I, I didn't. I said the culture views them as crooks. The other guy obviously thought so too. No, he didn't. <laughs> I think on this one we'll agree. No, I'm, I'm defending businessmen here. I said the culture views them as crooks, and that's bad. That's why capitalism is losing. It's because the culture views businessmen as crooks. I view them as heroes. I gotta do what I gotta do to make money. Like, I'm sure it's a lawyer. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> If anybody didn't understand, I'm against socialism and full capitalism. <laughs> and it would be great if Canada was more capitalist. The problem, the reason the guy was skeptical is that he thinks the current government is not capitalist enough. Yes, they're moving maybe in the right direction. By the way, somebody has to ask me the question that was all over Facebook about my ignorance regarding the Canadian banking system. So somebody please ask that, yeah. Um, you were saying the, the battle is being lost. So how do you plan for the future? How do I plan for the future given that we're losing? Right. I'm trying to get us to win. Well, I know how you're planning, um, but how does, let's say, someone in business, they're not professional intellectuals, um, they, you know, they want to build their lives and, and things, are, things are going down quickly. So how, how do you plan? So I would say two things. One, I, I believe you have to fight. So I, I, I believe it, it, you, you have to do whatever you can to try to convince the culture to turn it around. And, and yes, uh, many of you businessmen are not intellectuals. Support the intellectuals. You know, uh, you know write a check. Uh, it, it, you see, you laugh. Why is it funny? It's true, right? The only way we can do what we do is because you guys write checks. If you don't write checks, we can't do it. Uh, and that's, I'm not telling you to do it sacrificially or altruistically. I'm saying it's in your self-interest. I'm your agent in this fight. Help me, right? So help those who are fighting the battle. Help those who are out there trying to advocate for capitalism and trying to change the world. Um, you know, and, and in your own life, speak up. You know, you can fight the battle on any level. You don't have to be an intellectual to fight this battle. All you have to say is, is I don't agree. That's not the way it is. I, you, know, I'm, you know, one of the biggest things businessmen can do, this goes to that other question, be proud. Be proud of your success. Stop apologizing. Stop apologizing to people that you make money. Stop apologizing to people that you're successful and you've done good stuff. Be, you know, let people see, if people had an image a proud businessman standing up there and defending their, their, their business and, their, and what they've done and how they've achieved. Imagine if, 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 if some of these, uh, you know, some of these bankers stood up to the stupid senators calling them, you know, and, and actually challenged them. None of them do. They all kind of fold. 
on a personal level, you know, you got to think about where the, the West is going and, and you got to preserve assets and you've got to think about how to put those assets in, in a place that uh, where, where they, they're likely to preserve their value and, you know, who knows what will happen. Either the great deflation or the great inflation of the future comes. Uh, you, you've got to think strategically about the future and think about those areas in the world which have a chance of surviving when the United States collapses. You know, it's probably not in the West. It's probably more likely in Asia. And even then, it's not going to be very good. Nobody's going to come out of this in good shape. You know, so you've got to think about strategies for wealth preservation, which I'm not going to get into right now. But this is, I mean, the decline of the West is real. The decline of America is real. It's happening. Whether it's happening, you know, super fast or just a little bit fast, it's happening and it's here. And I believe we have about 20 years to turn this around or we're lost. This is not a long-term thing. The 20 years is not a long-term for some of you are my age and you know 20 years goes by like that, right? This is about, this is a battle that's happening right now. And if we don't change this, if we don't turn this around the next 20 years, we're in deep, deep trouble. Out of curiosity, do you think Calvin Coolidge was a good president or a bad president? And should he be a role model? So as many conservatives love him in the States now. Calvin Coolidge, uh, you know, I'm not a historian, I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is he's a good president, uh, you know, probably the best of the 20th century, maybe. Um, you know, basically because he did very little. Uh, <laughs> I have a certain sympathy to Bill Clinton because he did very little, that's, that's not bad. You know, having sex in the White House is good because it distracts you from actually governing. Um, but no, uh, Coolidge handled, uh, well, he was, he was vice president at the time, but I forget who was the president during the, who was it? Harding. Harding uh, during the recession of 2021, and they handled it very well, and Coolidge generally handled it well. And it's really after Coolidge left office that the Federal Reserve went nuts and started printing money, you know, started inflating the economy in the late 1920s. So generally positive. So Europe is in terrible shape. The U.S. is in terrible shape economically. With the, I, I had to come here to Canada tonight from the U.S. to hear this kind of common sense, and I applaud you, and thank you so much for bringing this to Canada. Do you speak in the U.S.? That's question one. Question two is, um, do they let you speak? Is that really question one in the U.S.? Question two is, what? clearly Canada has done something fascinating and something well, and it seems to be uh, bipartisan. We've had fiscally responsible liberals that have balanced the budget in this country, Paul Martin, Chrétien, Stephen Harper. You know, conservatives, liberals seem to be doing a pretty good job here. What lessons, as you're paying attention to the banking system in Canada, the lessons and the, the way things have gone historically, economically in the last, let's say, decade, 15 years, what can Canada, arguably the brightest spot right now economically in the world, with maybe one or two other small exceptions, uh, what, what can Canada, what can the rest of the world learn from Canada and, and do you see, uh, what can each one of us in this room after we leave here tonight, having been enriched by hearing you, do maybe through our, our social networking, Facebook, et cetera, to spread the word and the message? So first of all, like me on Facebook <laughs> and follow me on Twitter. Um, and if you had, you would know that last year I probably gave about 100 talks like this, uh, 80 plus of them in the United States and uh, only a few internationally, but I do speak internationally, but not, not as much as in the US. I'm gonna get in trouble with Canadians because I agree with you about Canada, which I know a lot of people here resent and don't like. Uh, Canada is a bright spot in the world out there, not because it's doing the right things, but because it's doing fewer bad things than the rest of the world. <laughs> no, absolutely. So in the, in the mid-1990s, Canada got into real trouble. Uh, it, it was running huge uh, deficits, it had a huge amount of debt, the Canadian dollar was sinking, and there were real problems. And I don't know who the politician was, I don't know what happened, but the decision was made to cut government spending and to, and to, and to rationalize budgets. And, you know, again, I'm not an expert in Canadian economics, but it seems that if you look at the percent of government spending per GDP, it went down which is very unusual in the world out there. There's one other country that did the same thing. Anybody know who that is? Sweden. Socialist Sweden. They went bust because socialism drove them bankrupt and they started cutting government spending, cutting entitlement, cutting regulations, decreasing taxes. And they're doing okay. They're not doing great, but they're doing okay. 
Uh, and that happened about 15, 20 years ago as well, around the same time as it did in Canada, a little after Canada. I, I, yeah. Yeah, and, and so, um, so I think that lesson, when economy gets into trouble, you don't increase government spending, you decrease it. The problem with the sequester is it's too small. <laughs> If it was big, it would actually have a positive impact on the U.S. economy. It's too small to have any kind of impact on the U.S. economy. Um, there are a lot of lessons about reducing government spending, reducing government involvement, reducing that Americans can learn from Canada. Now, has Canada done enough? No. Does Canada overregulate? Absolutely. Does Canada have taxes that are too high? Yes. Is Canada healthcare system a disaster? Yes. If you're sick, if you're healthy, it's great. <laughs> socialized medicine is wonderful for healthy people. It is, I lived under socialized medicine. It's a disaster and that's why you have these buses that go down to the Mayo Clinic in, in, Rosh, in Rochester, Minnesota to get real treatment. My father was a doctor under socialized medicine in Israel. You know, Israel has one of the best healthcare systems in the world. There's more doctors per capita than any country in the world. Why? Because there's six million Jews. So of course you have more doctors than anywhere else. <laughs> And when my dad, with all those wonderful doctors, when my dad had a really sick patient who had the money, he would put him on a plane and fly him to the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic or somewhere else. There is no healthcare system in the world better, if you have money, than the United States healthcare system. And I'm not talking about a lot of money. If you're middle class, there's no place in the world where you get better treatment than the United States. Um, the myth about the United States healthcare system is, is, is shocking. Now, it's bad, because it could be a thousand times better if it was privatized. But certainly, it's, you know, Canada's the model for healthcare. So Canada's certainly a model for those. The other thing Canada is, is lucky, right? You're lucky because as energy prices went through the roof, you discovered you had a lot of oil in those oil sands, right? And energy has been a huge resource in terms of, of revenue for the Canadian government over the last 10 years. And, and, and because prices of oil went so high, it became economical to get that. So there's a bit of luck, but there's also smarts there because in America today, we have tons of energy. Yeah. And yet nobody, nobody will draw for it. Nobody will take it, right? So in spite of the fact that Canada is this environmentalist, leftist kind of general population, when it comes to actually making money, nobody cares about the environment. You go out and you take those sands and you turn them into oil, right? And you want to, in spite of the fact that Canadians are far more environmentally conscious than Americans are, you want to take that pipeline in all directions and get that oil into the world. So there's a certain pragmatic nature uh, in, in Canada when it comes to natural resources that even in the United States we don't have. We've given up. In, Ca in California has vast quantities of natural gas, huge. And they won't go after them because it's fracking, and you know fracking is the new devil, right? <laughs> so um, there's a lot, a lot positive to be said about Canada. And if anybody wants to know about Canadian banking system, why it's superior to the American banking system, has been for 200 years, uh, you can ask me. Yes. We've got the room for 20 more minutes. So two more questions. I, I give long answers, I guess. <laughs> Um, two quick questions. Um, I find anarcho-capitalists and libertarians always at odds, and I know you're a libertarian as far as I know. Um, so how would you keep a government that's small that way? Because when government's small, economy grows, economy grows, government swells. Uh, question two, if America collapses even worse soon, which a lot of people are saying, um, how is that going to affect Canada? How badly is that going to affect Canada? Because I heard that we don't even have gold reserves, we just have American dollar reserves. So uh, let, me, let me start. I'm not a libertarian, just so we're clear. I'm an objectivist, which is Ayn Rand's philosophy. Uh, I don't agree with libertarians on lots of things, including anarcho-capitalism. A, a lot of libertarians in the United States are anarcho-capitalists. So how do you keep government small? By having the right ideas around small government. Uh, how, how do you keep anarchy? I mean, I don't believe anarchy is, it, it's possible to have anarchy. Because what will happen under anarchy? The guys with the biggest guns will take over everybody else and establish a state, right? They'll establish a government. That's what government means. It's the guys with the guns. Um, <laughs> so I believe in a small state, the only way to preserve it is to have the right ideas is to be vigilant about it. It's to protect it. It's up here. 
You cannot, you will never have capitalism as lo if people don't believe in capitalism. Yeah. You will never have anything unless, even the founding fathers, right? Why don't we have a, the, the founding fathers principle? Because people stop believing in them. So it's education, education, education. You have to have the philosophical structure and people have to believe in that philosophy. Otherwise it goes away. Nothing is metaphysically given when it comes to uh, uh, people's uh, you know, uh, free will. What was the second question? Oh, when America goes. Look, I, let me just be clear. I don't think America's going anywhere anytime soon. I don't think collapse is imminent. Uh, you know, I'm not Peter Schiff, if you know Peter Schiff. I, I don't think it's going to happen instantly in the world, you know. And I said, but I think if it ever happens, Canada's screwed. Everybody in the world is screwed. Yeah. The fact is, that whether we like it or not, America is not only the economic center of the world today. But it is the, it is the, um, it's still perceived, particularly in Asia, as the shiny sitting on the hill. It's the model. It's what everybody tries to emulate. And if it goes, there's nothing to emulate. And all those cultures will revert to what they've always reverted to, which is authoritarianism, central planning, and disaster. The only thing that keeps Asian countries moving towards more free markets is the model of America. And when that disappears, that vision disappears. Canada will have a hard time. I don't think Canada will collapse, but Canada will have a very hard time with if America's gone, because we're the number one trading partner of most Canadians. Trade is win-win. If one side of the trade dies, right, disappears, you're not, you, you now are not winning anymore. You, you, you don't have the benefits of that trade. This is why free trade is such a wonderful thing. That's why f we should have much more free trade between Canada and the U.S., because we would all benefit enormously from that. Trade is always a win-win. So we want more of it, not less of it. When one country collapses, everybody loses. Um, could you please address the question you alluded to earlier when you mentioned that the Canadian banking system is so much better than the U.S. banking system? Yeah, the U.S. banking system was crippled at its, uh, at its very uh, early stages, uh, going back to the founding of America, really, the early part of the 19th century. It was always perceived, banking was always perceived as something negative in America. And as a consequence, banks were limited in size and in scope. So way before Sarbanes, uh, uh, Glass-Steagall, anything like that, banks, for example, in the United States were not allowed to branch out of their state. And in some places, in many places in the United States, you couldn't branch out of your county or your city. So what you got in the United States is lots of banks, hundreds and thousands. So for example, in the 1970s, there were 21,000 depository institutions in the US. Right. Canada never had that aversion to banking, that, that idea that banks are somehow evil and we have to keep them small and, and tidy. And as a consequence, you saw massive consolidation in the early days, and you got five banks, not because the government decided there would be five banks, not today it is, because they regulate capital concerns, all you can't start, it's very hard to start a bank in Canada. But in those days, because they allowed mergers and consolidations, and they allowed bank, Canadian banks were universal banks. There was no Glass-Steagall, they could do they could do depository, they could do investment banking. In the United States, even that was separated out in the 1930s against because we, we didn't trust bankers. And so there's always been an aversion to banking in the US. It's only in 1994 was on a federal level banks allowed to branch across states. There's a, the interstate banking law was passed in 1994. Before that, some states had the ability to go across states. You had to create a different holding company. It was a mess, right? And since 1994, the number, and, and because of the SNL crisis and lots of other things, the number of depositing institutions has gone down from 21,000 in the 70s uh, to 7,000 today. 7,000, right? I mean, we're bigger than Canada, but do we really need 7,000 banks? No. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artifact of all that regulation and controls that, again, go back into the capitalist era of the 19th century, even back then. And in that sense, Canada Bank, Canadian banks, because they could diversify geographically, because they could diversify in terms of their scope, in terms of the functions, were much healthier than American banks that were either, they were very limited geographically and were very limited in their scope. They could do uh, either commercial banking or investment banking, but couldn't do both.
And indeed, the reason Glass-Steagall went away was because American banks couldn't compete with European banks and other banks that were universal banks that could do all of these different aspects. So the whole story about Glass-Steagall is... Okay, so this is going to be the last question, and we're going to have to wrap up. Well, then it has to be a good one. <laughs> the pressure's on. Yes, and I'll be signing my book if, uh, if anybody wants my signature. Hi, Aaron. Uh, really enjoy uh, everything that, that you spoke on tonight. Um, what I'm still questioning is with full anarchy, you say that they're going to get the power and have all the guns. But I mean, doesn't the government already have all the guns? And by going back to limited government, we'd just be resetting the clock back to 1789 and this whole thing would just happen again. Don't you think it would be interesting to just turn off that light switch and, and try full anarchy? No. I mean, I think that's a disaster. And I, would, I would rather have all we have today than full anarchy any day. I would rather have the statists today than full anarchy because I think my life is safer today than under full anarchy. But let me say, first of all, switching on to 1789, I'm taking it right now. <laughs> right? Even if, even if we deteriorate afterwards. But this is the difference. You have to ask the question of why did the founding fathers fail long term? Why is it that 200 and something years after the founding of America has that vision of limited government disappeared? And Ayn Rand's answer, and I agree with her on this, is that there was no philosophical foundation for what the founding fathers were trying to do. They established a government under the principle of individual rights without a philosophical understanding of what individual rights meant, which required a morality of self-interest, an ethical code based on self-interest, which required an understanding of human reason and what that demanded. You know, what reason is, how it works, and therefore why rational self-interest is, is the right ethical code. So what they built is they built a house on quicksand. The politics are great, right? The political system is good, but everything underneath politics, ethics, epistemology, metaphysics, are rotten to the core. And as the 19th century evolves, those ethical beliefs rise up and they start destroying the politics and all the rest of the foundation. And when in the 19th century, late 19th century, the progressives come and they say, wait a minute, your life, you're supposed to be morally responsible for your neighbor. What is this self-interest? What is this capitalism? This is immoral. The capitalists had nothing to say because they didn't have an ethical code to challenge them. And they capitulated at the end of the day. Rand is the first philosopher, the first philosopher, at least since Aristotle, to actually present us with a moral code that start building that foundation on which this good political system lays. So if you reverse the clock back to 1789, but with objectivism, with the moral code of rational self-interest, with reason as man's basic means of survival, with a metaphysics of reality, A is A, then it doesn't deteriorate, because now you can defend it. Now you can defend it against the progressives, now you can defend it against the socialists, the Kantians, the, the whole gamut of European philosophies. And now it's a house that can stand, and it won't. So I have complete <coughs> belief that if, that if you could establish this country but with the right philosophy, then limited government will persevere. Anarchy is a rejection of philosophy. There are no philosophical principles. Just do whatever the hell you want to do. It's a complete <laughs> rejection of philosophy and ethics and morality and any kind of standard, objective standard out there. And as a consequence, it is doomed to failure. It cannot survive. There is no standard. There is no truth. There is no right or wrong. And I know you want to argue with me. And, and I know, and I, you know, every, it's a shame that anarcho-capitalism has to be the last question. But... <laughs> It is wrong in a deep, deep sense. It is, it, is, it is wrong philosophically. It is based on a philosophy of subjectivism. It is based on a philosophy of relativism. It is a complete repudiation and rejection of objectivism at every single step. How about, one last question then. How about founding a new country that's based on these principles? Yeah.
and then it's more depressing. You can't found a new country. Look, it doesn't, it can't happen. Look at all the attempts, because libertarians have tried this all over the world. They go and they, they inhabit an atoll in the Fiji Islands, and what happens? The king of Fiji sends the troops and kicks them out. Uh, they just tried to start uh, I these, uh, these independent cities in Honduras. The Hondurans changed their constitution, which allowed for the, the establishment of these independent cities, and of course the Supreme Court of Honduras then says, no, that's illegitimate. Uh, you know, Patrick Friedman, Mitchell Friedman's grandson, is trying to start floating islands where you'll have your own. It ain't gonna work, guys. There is no place on the planet where you can start a new government. Nobody's gonna give it to you. If you're successful, they'll shut it down. There's only one way to do it. I figured it out, right? There's a way to establish a new country, right? You know, like a floating island. What? Facebook? You can't establish a country. You need a nuke. You need a nuclear bomb, and it needs to be targeted at DC. And then you need to be able to say, in a way that everybody believes you, leave us alone or you're dead. And then maybe you have a chance. Okay. Maybe. But other than that, the fact is that if people see you succeed, they will shut you down. Imagine you started a, a free city in Honduras, and you had true freedom, individual rights, the founding principles, everything. You had on the right philosophy and everything. And you had banks there, and the banks are truly free banks, so they respected privacy. How long do you think that would last? I give it like an hour. Before the Marines are there, and they're shutting you down in the name of, I don't know, uh, money laundering, drug trade, or a thousand other things that the American government would claim that you're doing that violates the, you know, the American government. I mean, there's no way they're going to let you get away with it. This is not some practical problem that we just need to find the right geography. This is a philosophical problem. And if you don't change the culture, you lose. If you don't change the culture, you lose. And changing the culture is hard. And it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of effort, and it's all about education. It's education, education, education. There are no quick fixes, there are no shortcuts, there's no magic bullet, there is none. It's about fighting, speaking, writing, talking, and more and more and more of that. That's it. Thank you all. Thank you.